that, we get to come together and worship together. Um, and we have a communion this, um, this morning as well. Um, so yeah, if you guys would just stand with me. I just want to open up a prayer and hand it off to the worship team. And, you know, like I said, we're going to have a time of worship, communion. Uh, the kids will go downstairs and then hear a short message from Pastor Bruce um, just to start off our morning here. Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you for an opportunity to come to you to, to lay down our hearts for you, Lord. Lord, and I just pray if anybody's carrying something heavy in this morning, Lord, that they can lay that down to you as well, Lord, and just open their hearts to the Holy Spirit this morning. We just pray for our community, and just encourage to see, again, we had Iron Man last weekend and rugby this weekend, that just people want to be in this community for for certain things, Lord, events, Lord, and as I look out the window at the building, Lord, that I just pray that that can be a, a beacon for those folks that come into our community, Lord, that they can, we can be a place of hope and grace and love, Lord. Lord, just bless this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. We have a wonderful opportunity this morning to set everything aside set of uh, what's going on in lives and um, the, t the to-do list that needs to get done for the week, but we get to set all of that aside, and we get to worship God this morning. We get to lift his name on high, and so I, I encourage you to let him consume you this morning. Instead of the consuming list of the checklist, let him consume your heart this morning. Hallelujah. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and let us sing. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. Thou burning sun with golden beams, thou silver moon with softer gleam. Yeah. 
Do I? 
help and get ready to serve communion here. We're going to break bread. Um, Jesus, Jesus' brother James told us that every good and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variable or shadow of turning. In other words, there's not a hint that his goodness is not forever. His goodness knows no end. And of course, we see that throughout scripture. And so when James tells us that, John told us, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but will have John also told us that when Jesus came, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. And Jesus himself, he doesn't give us a lot of options about how we uh, partake of his life. We, by faith, enter into relationship with Jesus Christ, him who is life, him who contains all the wisdom and the counsel of God came to earth and was broken so that we could partake of his life. And he doesn't give us options. The option is him. <laughs> and he also gave us this beautiful uh, supper to share together. It, you, you could say it's symbolic, and it is, but it's not. My suggestion is today, what do you need today? What do I need today? I need Jesus. I need his life. I need his light, his counsel, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness. And so as we come to break bread together, let's come with faith saying, Jesus, I need to be a full partaker with you. I need to put my faith in you completely. And that's what I represent. That's what I'm speaking. That's what I'm proclaiming in my heart as I come to take communion and break the Lord's Supper, break bread together. We're proclaiming again our faith in Christ. And it's not halfway. It's not, I need a little bit today, Jesus, but tomorrow I'm not sure. I might find something else to feast on. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And here Jesus is the word of God come to earth and broken for us. Hallelujah. And I encourage you today to come with faith. Come believing that the Son of God came and was broken that you and I might have life. And that in partaking that you and I would fully engage our spiritual resources, our faith, and we would say, Jesus, you are my all. You're my source, you're my resource, you're my hope, you're the beginning, you're the end. Everything comes from you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. On the night he was betrayed, I was going to read it, but I have to put my glasses on. We'll just have to ad lib. On the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke the bread, and he said, Take and eat, for this is my body, which is broken for whom? Hallelujah. Not for a ritual, not for anything else, but so that you and I would understand that we are complete partakers of his divinity when we put our faith in him. And then he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the cup of the new covenant. As often as you drink this, drink this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me, knowing that Jesus is the one who fulfills the covenant. We simply, by faith, enter in and receive what he has provided. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to invite you to come. I encourage you to hang on to your bread and your juice till you get back to your seats. We'll partake together as the body of Christ. So, Father, as we come, we come with faith. We thank you that every good and every perfect gift
comes from above. In you, Lord, there is no variable, no shadow of turning. And today as we come, we want to proclaim that we do not trust in anything else. We have no other resource. We have nothing else that we want to put our faith in but you, Lord Jesus, your broken body and your shed blood. That's what we need. of Christ. I thank you for each one that's here today. Lord, I think about the members of the body that are sick today and not with us. We pray for them. We pray for a touch from your Holy Spirit. We pray that a touch from heaven would meet them this morning, Lord. We pray for the body that may be traveling, those that, that are in different places today. We, we pray for them as we break bread together, Lord. Hallelujah.
partake of the bread together as your body, are we not all partakers of that same bread? And we partake in faith with joy, with thanksgiving. what God gives us is his goodness. Amen.
of the goodness of God. I'll say it one more time, all my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also li may live our new lives. Thanks be to God. Good job, Callie. Welcome this morning. If you're visiting with, a, with us, we're grateful to have you here. Um, it's always great to have new faces worship with us, so thank you for being here. Um, just a handful of announcements. Like I said, we're going to have baptism this afternoon. Um, the, the goal aim time is 1230. We will do our best to <laughs> stick to that time. And if you can't make that, that's okay. Um, but we still would love for you to join us at Cape Mountain Park for the, the church picnic um, for that, that portion. And Bolt says to bring something to share you don't that is okay please don't feel like if you don't have something that you can't come because we still want you to be there to fellowship together um, just a quick shout out to our youth group um, it seems that every time they plan a trip to the water park last year it was freezing this year they had a total downpour but I was told that you could see Jesse in the back they still had a great time um, so maybe one of these years to have a nice hot sunny day and the water will be cool in the proper way uh, but um, focus on kids, you know that. Um, we do have kids church um, after offering here in a minute. So if you have your um, child, just ask that you bring them down and check them in. Um, and now I'm going to let Heather take over for kids camp announcement. Yes. Good morning. Um, so this year our uh, kids camp, a.k.a. Vacation Bible School, um, is the theme is scuba and it's diving deep into a friendship with God. 
And so it, the date is uh, August 27th through the 30th, and it's going to be from 6 to 8.30 each night for those four nights. And we are looking for help, um, however you feel led. If it's just praying, pray for these kids. Pray that God would start preparing these kids' hearts now to receive that friendship, that forever friendship with Jesus. And if you've never been a, um, a, a participant of BBS, however it is, Kids Camp, um, it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing to be a part of. It's life changing, really, because uh, the ultimate goal, why we do Kids Camp, why we do uh, BBS, is expanding God's kingdom. That's that's bottom line. That's what we're doing. We want to plant these the seeds into these kids that God is for them and that there is a forever friend that they can always count on regardless of any situation, especially with the world the way it is to, to now, that they can count and they can pray to God anytime about anything and that God will love them regardless. Um, so I encourage you to be a part of it. It is a uh, as you, as God pours into you his love and his goodness into your life, you get to pour out into these kids. And as you pour out, God fills you up again. It's amazing. It's amazing how that works. Um, so we have uh, different uh, ways you can help out. Um, there's uh, crew leaders. You'll be going around with the kids each evening, and it's really fun. It's a great team bonding. You get to really know these kids and get to pray over them, prayer requests, and just get excited because learning about God, I don't know if you know this, but it's very exciting, and you're always learning. I mean, whether you're zero, whether you're 99, you will learn something about God until the day he calls you home. Um, right. And it's fun to learn about him. Um, and so there's that, and I mean, uh, they learn about the friendship they can have with God through uh, hands-on science experiments, team building games, through snacks, um, through a new uh, station this year is called St Sticky Scripture, where they learn scripture. They get to take it home with them each night, and they get to memorize it, and they get to apply it into their lives. So it's something that you want to be a part of. I guarantee you, it's going to be, it is, it is tiring, I'm not going to lie, but it is so worth it because God fills you and he sustains you and he gives you exactly what you need for that night. Um, and so it's such a great time. So if you feel led to volunteer, you can talk to myself, you can talk to Catherine uh, Pelkey and just a little, to learn a little bit more about it. Um, the sign-up sheet is in the back and um, if you can only commit to one night, that's awesome. If you can only commit to or all the nights, that's wonderful too. And so for um, each volunteer is a thank you. We provide you dinner as well um, for those four nights. Dinner will start at five o'clock, but we'll have a meeting before that. But if you just feel led, just pray about it. Take a few moments and pray. Lord, is this something that um, you would like me to do? Where can I, where can I serve? Where can I uh, plant seeds for a future generation? And um, there are in that back table um, behind the back row, there is uh, flyers too, if you can take one. It tells you a little bit more about it and kids can, uh, the parents can register their kids on the a QR code or there's a go on our church's website to register. Um, so spread the word because um, we're about, it's gonna be expanding God's kingdom those four days and beyond. So it's awesome. And the parents have an opportunity as they hear the, the message, as they pick their kids up, um, they get to hear a little bit of the message as well at the end. And it's four days of just having fun learning about the Lord and diving deep into that friendship with God. So I encourage you. It's a lot of fun. It's tiring, but boy, God fills you during it. So thank you. Thank you, Heather. I'll just chime in one of the things I find personally that I, from volunteering is because of their kids, and I have kids that in that age group, when I'm out in the community with my, in school or other places, those kids recognize me from this moment. And that one week, but there are multiple times throughout the year that they see, oh, that's their dad. He was at the church event. And then they tell their parents, like that's the ripple effect. You might not know in that moment how far it actually reaches out right. to families. So, Volunteering is important in that in that regard, so I just wanted to add that. Um, so if you guys don't mind just standing up, I'm going to pray over the offering here. And um, there's baskets in the front and the back, no obligations, um, and the online versions as well too. So, Lord, we just thank you for VBS and what it means to 
the opportunity for us to serve, for the blessings that it has on the families, the impact that it has on our community. And, and I just pray for those impacts that are far greater than we even know, Lord. I just pray for your outreach in that, um, in our week, Lord, and what it means to the kids that come and attend, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for the provisions you've given our church, Lord. I pray for continued um, work on the building next door, just for to continue to go off, off without any hitches, Lord. We just pray for the remainder funding that we need to, to complete the project, Lord, and to fill the space once it's built. Lord, I just ask that you take what is given today, Lord, and use it to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
curtsy. Okay, well, good morning. We're going to share just briefly. And I know briefly is a relative term. Um, we have been sharing from well, a num number of places, but we begin in Colossians chapter 3. Um, and talking about uh, living our lives as the people of God. And, and it's, uh, so we've, we've been about six or seven weeks talking about this idea what it means to live as the people of God and uh, beginning with this passage can can we take that that uh, whatever it is announcement down that's behind our um, using this passage from Colossians chapter 3 to and Paul does down through the whole section of Colossians chapter 3, talks about this reality of living uh, in heavenly places with Christ. And, and as we get to the end, you know, I kind of want to, I asked a couple questions last week, and it, it's kind of been burning in my spirit a little bit. Uh, and one, one of the questions one is, number one, have you been raised with Christ, right? There's, there's this obvious, so as Paul's saying, if you've been raised, this is, there's a pattern of life that happens. But the first question is, is have you been raised with Christ? Um, and I, I just want to talk about that for just a little bit and then talk a little bit about what it means. Um... Scripture is pretty clear that if, we're, if, if we are Christ followers, we live differently. Now, we tiptoe around that in the modern church a little bit. It probably used to be, you know, a little more. Uh, but there's something about what it means to be a Christ follower that uh, changes all of our relationships, all of our behaviors, every, who we are as people. We live differently if we have been risen with Christ. And I want to just uh, take a little bit of time here and go back to Ephesians chapter 2. Because this idea of being raised with Christ, there's, there's kind of a, uh, a little bit of a... Uh, there's, two way, there's two deaths we talk about a little bit. Um, not necessarily two deaths, but two aspects of it. And this here, uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, I'm going to make this, this more of an exhortation. Um, Paul's talking to the Ephesian church, and he explains where they were, or what the reality was, before they knew Christ. Right? There's a reality that if you do not know Christ, if you have not placed your faith in Christ, you're dead. <laughs> You're dead unto God. 
and you're living, you're, you know, what's the word, walking dead men, you know, uh, it's interesting that we, we use this term also as a believer, but Paul's talking about the reality of our life outside of Christ, the, 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 the average the person who is walking through this world without the life of Christ in them are spiritually dead. And Paul is pointing that out here to the Ephesians. He says, and you, you Ephesians, the Ephesian church, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You followed the course of this world. You were following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of of mankind. Dead. That's what he's saying to the, the Ephesians church. This is who you once were. Outside of Christ, you were walking. You know, I walked in my life. I had grown up in the church. I understood the principles of the church. I understood, uh, I suppose I understood the gospel. I don't know. Um, but I was walking in darkness. And I was aimless. I didn't know which end was up. I think I shared last week, my friends towards the end of my career of partying, they were like, you're miserable, dude. What is wrong with you? Well, I was living in a dead lifestyle. There was no life in it. I, was, I knew it was a dead end, and I was struggling. But the, the human condition outside of Christ is spiritually dead. And that's what Paul's saying to the Ephesians church here. Now, it doesn't mean people can't have joy or can't have you know certain attributes of living in this world but there is a reality that outside of Christ the life that is in God is foreign to people to mankind just like the rest of mankind he says here you know when when in the, the famous passage that I, I spoke earlier today for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but will have everlasting life, right? He's saying, basically, they're dying already. And the promise is, is that we, if we, am I hollering? The, pro <laughs> the promise is, if we, my wife doesn't like it when I howl. Um, and I have an, a microphone and everything. Um, the promise is that if we believe on Christ, something happens, and it's called life. It's not called heaven. It's not called a future place that we go. It's called life. You can have everlasting life. In other words, it's something that takes place, and you participate in now. And you've been removed from the place of darkness, from a place of spiritual death, and you've been brought into the kingdom of light, and we walk in that place which is everlasting life. And I started that in John 3.16. Whosoever believes on him should not perish, but will have everlasting life. And then in the next verse, we don't hear too often, he that believeth not is condemned already. Walking, already walking in that place of spiritual death and darkness. Now, I've shared with people before, I've shared with my friend, friends, I've shared with, <clears throat> and I've talked about that spiritual darkness. I remember particularly talking about, I don't know, even know what I said. And uh, this person I was speaking to, there was a couple people, that's exactly how I feel. I feel that. I feel this darkness. I feel like I can't, there's, there's, and as far as I know, that person has not, I don't know if that person ever has chosen Christ. Even though they understood the feeling of spiritual separation, they understood the reality of their life, that it was dead end, that there didn't seem to be life in it. And it made sense, but that person was not able to believe on Christ in that moment. Maybe someday. But this is the condition of mankind. And so when Paul in Colossians 3 says, if you have been risen, he's saying, 
If you have come out of darkness into God's light, if you have been born into the life of Christ, you've been delivered from the place of darkness, from spiritual death into spiritual life. When that happens, you live differently. He goes on here. All right, so we we read from Ephesians 2. He said, We all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, And we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. And then this is one of these, uh, this is a transition. And the big transition here is, but God. (laughs) So he talks about the plight of mankind. He talks about the circumstances of living outside of the grace of God that's in Christ. But he says, but God being rich in mercy, is that what it says? Yes. Because of the great love where, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This goes back to what is he telling him in Colossians? If you've been raised... Think on those things above where Christ is. Where is he? He's in heavenly places. In Christ, we're with him, and he's encouraging them in this. I want to say, just because it's really important, if you walk in darkness, if you do not have spiritual light, if you wonder why you're on this earth, why you struggle with passions, why you struggle with... uh, emptiness, loneliness, I would suggest you need to understand what the mercy of God is that comes to us in Christ Jesus. You need to hear that voice, that still, small voice of God. The voice of Christ that says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest from the passions of the flesh, from the things we struggle with, the concerns about death, the concerns about all these things. And and Christ says, come to me, come to me, and I will give you rest. I also want to make it clear what this, this coming to Christ is not a matter of good works. It's not a matter of if I just straighten my life up, But it's a matter of recognizing who Christ is, that he's the son of God, that he came to earth, took on flesh so that he could live a righteous life, die a death that we should have died, but rise again so that we can put our faith in him and be set free from the law of sin and death. And really what it means for you and for me we recognize who Christ is. We recognize our need. We, we, we recognize that Christ is the solution. And we put our faith in Christ. Now, faith is a funny thing. This is supposed to be short. When I grew up, I pictured faith as always a a, uh, a run to the altar during an altar call. Or others pictured faith in, in various different ways. But faith is simply you and I understanding who Jesus is and saying in our heart of hearts, I believe. And I put my life in his hands. I trust Christ with my life. When we used to do the evangelism explosion, we would use the example of faith. The the example would be a chair, right? That you can look at a chair. You can see four legs. You can see it looks sturdy. You can say, I believe that chair would support me. But you're really not putting your faith in it until you sit in the chair. (laughs) Right? And that's what faith is. It's sitting in the chair. It's saying, Jesus, I cannot solve this problem myself. I cannot find freedom from my 
earthly passions. I can't find freedom from who I am. I feel empty, and I am trusting you, Jesus, with my life, my desire, my will, my dreams, all those things. I'm giving them into your hand. And the, I promise you, when you do that from your heart of hearts, Jesus meets you there. Amen. And that mercy of God that Paul talks about, God being rich in mercy, that becomes an experience for us that translates us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Pick which side you want. I remember when I came to Christ, I came to Christ here. As I told you, I was miserable. I was really into the party scene and was getting myself in trouble. And uh, I remember praying here with a bunch of men. And uh, I remember them having me repeat a prayer, right? Anybody who heard that, right? And that's not, I'm not saying it's bad. But in the end, at some point in, in that prayer, I said, I said, God, I want to mean this. That was a simple, it wasn't a prayer, was it? It was just a, a thought that went through my head. And in that moment, boom, I knew that faith had touched God's heart. And I was instantly just transformed. Not completely, because you guys still see my faults here. But um, I was instantly transformed. And the next thing you know, the church was empty. I was still in here praying with about three guys. The point I'm trying to make there is how you say yes to Jesus, God knows. You can say a sinner's prayer and not be changed. I had a friend, and I've shared this many times because this is relevant. We shared the word of God with her. We talked to her about Jesus. We shared many things. She worked with me. And she would come, and she'd read the scriptures. She had read the Koran as a child. Uh, she lived in Kuwait. And one day, she drove up to the house. Zoe and I were there. And she said, I believe. <laughs> I was just driving my car, and I realized I believe right? All of a sudden, the Word of God, the understanding of who Jesus was, it clicked in, and faith made its contact. He loves us, even though we're dead in our trespasses and sin. His great mercy, He desires to pour it out on your life and my life, and it really takes just a step of faith. Step towards Jesus. So here, he says, he raised us up with him, seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and he raised us up with him, whoops, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us. And I'm just going to go to the end of this. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It's the message I'm trying to get across here. If you're being baptized today, uh, if you're questioning about your faith today, this salvation, this mercy of God is completely by grace. It's completely God's gift. It's a gift we receive, how? Through faith. For by grace you are saved. In other words... It's not based upon what you do. It's based upon what you believe. If you believe on Jesus, he imparts his grace to us. It's not of works so that no one may boast. Um, this is one of the most beautiful things about the gospel. None of us can boast. If you have received the grace of God that comes through Christ... None of us can boast in anything except Jesus. Isn't that great? That means, that means we're all at a level playing field. Nobody here is any greater than the other. And Christ deserves all the glory. By grace you are saved, not a result of works. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Um, so that's what it means when Paul says, if you have been risen with Christ, it means you have placed your faith in Christ, your faith in Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world, as the Son of God who came to earth to die for your sins and mine and has risen and he's seated at the right hand of Father and you have put your faith in him. That's what it means to be risen with Christ. And I want to challenge, so first I'll just say that. If you're here today, it's a simple thing. Believe. I'm not going to tell you exactly what that looks like, what that sounds like, but you personally have to put your faith in Jesus. And I'm not going to get you in the corner and put your arm behind your back. Holy Spirit can do that just fine. But you personally have to make that decision. It's a humbling. There's a, yeah, there's a place of humility. There's a place of surrender. But it's a place of freedom and joy. So Paul says, if you have been risen, and that's what it means to be risen. Now here's what I want us to think about, and I'm going to wrap this up. If you have been risen, if you consider yourself, if you have experienced the mercy of God that comes through Jesus Christ, how is that affecting your life today? I think maybe as Christians we've become a little nonchalant about this great gift. Yeah, yeah, I did that a long time ago. Right now I'm into this. Right now I'm doing that. Yeah, I said the prayer. And I don't mean to be, but I, I just, this has been on my heart. How does that affect my life? How do I live? I think that's a, a line from Francis Schaeffer. How then should we live? If we are risen with Christ, how should we live? And where does it take place in my life? And I'm not going to go into it too much, but just at the very end of this, in Ephesians, verse 10, I believe, we are His workmanship, right? We have trusted Christ. We are His workmanship. The Holy Spirit is at work in our life if we have put our faith in Christ. And we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. In other words, there's something that should be coming out of our lives as Christians, which God has prepared beforehand for us, that we should walk in them. You know, the Christian life is a walk. Did you know that? It's a walk. And the walk is based upon... The experience of being risen with Christ. All right, I'm going to read one more passage, and then we're going to, we're going to talk about this more. But this is uh, from Romans. The Apostle Paul says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? He's challenging them. He's saying the same thing, really, he's, he's talking about in Colossians. Uh, he's, there's, there's some lawlessness in the camp. And he's saying, wait a minute. We don't continue in sin. Yes, grace is abundant. God's forgiving. God's merciful. But the call is to live differently. How can we who died to sin, here's that die again, right? So we were dead. But when we come into life in Christ, there's another death that happens. And that's that part of us, that old nature that wants to continue to live in, in lawlessness. How can we who died to sin still live in it? We like to hear about the grace, <laughs> and grace is good. Grace is what enables us to live above sin. It's not our own works. We, we'll talk about this more, but we'll, I'm going to continue reading since this is the baptism scripture. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into what? His death. First of all, 
just observe, those are being baptized. There's an assumption that everybody was baptized. Christians are baptized. But he also says, this is what it means. It means you have died. And those passions that Paul was talking about in Ephesians, you once lived according to the prince of the power of the air, according to your fleshly lust. You lived according to those things. Guess what? When you identify with Christ, you said those things are dead. We were buried. That's one reason we like baptism by immersion. I'm not, but I do like the image of we were buried. Therefore, with him, by baptism into his death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might what? Walk in newness of life. Hallelujah. Baptism, it, have you been risen with, have you, are you risen with Christ? Where, where's our mind? Have you been buried with Christ? Well, some stuff. <laughs> I'm, I want to challenge us. I want to challenge us to say, God, I want that buried with you. I want that old man to be dead, and I want to walk in newness of life. Let's sing a song. I better. Um, so, I always think I have more time. You're welcome to come up, you guys. Um, so Dallas Willard has a. Uh, Dallas Willard has a. Uh, a f- teaching, and he uses the. The, the vim, you know, as in vim and vigor, uh, vision, intention, and means. Paul gives us, a, and we'll probably talk about this some more, Paul gives us a lot of vision of what it means to live like a Christian. That's what he was doing in Colossians 3. He says, if you've been risen, live differently. <laughs> Your whole life is affected by this. He, and he gives us vision about what that looks like all through Scripture. But then he says, you and I, we, need, we have to have intention. We have to see the vision and say, God, yes, I want to walk in newness of life. I want this vision to be a part of who I am. And it's not a pull yourself up by the bootstrap message. Because the means, the ability is the grace of God. As we surrender ourselves to him, our purpose in our life, he changes our hearts. Our behavior changes as our hearts change, right? Because that's what he's looking for. He's looking for our hearts. So we're going to close. There's, I, I threw a lot in there in short order. But if you're being baptized today, a couple of young people and Lori, um, Walk in newness of life. That's, that's the promise. Now, the act of baptism is something God gave us that's powerful. And it speaks of the spiritual. It speaks of what it means to die with Christ. And so I encourage and I pray that as these, these baptizees are baptized, that that reality of Christ will be so profound in their thinking and their thoughts as they go forward that they would rise up and walk in newness of life. It's a life-changing moment. And Jesus gave us this for a reason. Because we need these moments in our lives. But let's sing. And then we'll pray.
salvation through repentance at the cross on which he died. Hear my absolution, forgiveness for my sin. And I seek beneath the waters that Christ was buried in. I will. gather out there. We'll probably sing a couple songs. Uh, It's at Oregon Pond. Lori wanted to share something here. I think she's on her way back, I hope. Um, So I'm going to ask Lori to come and share, and then we'll close after that. But uh, the rest we'll invite uh, to share. Usually out there, we gather, as I said, at Oregon Pond, which is right at the entrance to Buck Pond. Then we come back to Cape Mountain Park and uh, have a a picnic. But... um, there she is. So I want to ask Lori to share because she came up and thought maybe it'd be good. She's a little nervous, but we're all going to stay standing because we're on her side. Zoe's going to walk with her. Here, here, here. She says I'm pretty loud already. I did. 
didn't want to see you or listen or try to learn how you never let me go. Thank you for seeing my heart and loving me anyway. Thank you for your gentle guidance to turn around for your word and Jesus' love for his commitment to loving us so much that he paid it all. I'm sorry for taking this gift of your love for granted, for being hard-hearted, full of myself, deliberately harming myself with alcohol, marijuana, by taking for granted my health and the intricate and delicate body that you've given me. Thank you that I can turn towards you for healing my soul and teaching me better. I give my whole heart, mind, body, and soul gratefully to you in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come with me. something else outside. That was God. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, there's something else I'd like you to share, but we'll share that out there too uh, uh, before the baptism. But uh, So, thank you, Lord. We're going to dismiss trying to keep, keep things moving. Um, we encourage everybody to come out, be a part of the baptism, and then to Cape Mountain Park after uh, for fellowship. Uh, we'd like to pray with uh, whoever would like prayer. Um, Brother Dalka, I forget your first name already. Okay, well, I want you to come up. I'd like to pray with you. Um, but otherwise, we'll dismiss. We have prayer teams too. Others, be other prayer teams here just to pray if anybody else needs prayer. Father God, we go in your grace. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you're at work in the hearts men, women, and children. You're a God who changes. You're a God who transforms and calls us to newness of life. And so we rejoice in that today. We give you thanks. We give you praise. We love you, Lord. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you out there. 1230 is baptism, so we got a little bit of time, but I didn't want to rush anyone.